I would like to welcome you all to this talk where I will be talking about how we can use open data to predict market movements. Um, it's going to be a short talk, so I'll be really fast. So a little bit about myself. My name is Asha Saini. I work as a uh, senior advisor with the competitive intelligence team at Dell Technologies. I've been with the company for a little over two years now. Um, I'm based in Boston, and I'm here just for this conference. I hope you enjoy the talk and learn something new from this talk. Uh, I'll briefly describe what, what is open data, common crawl. Uh, has anyone here heard of common crawl? I'll be talking a little bit about what is Gartner's magic quadrant, uh, what I mean by market movements. We've done a ton of ad hoc analysis on this common crawl data, and uh, it is really hard for me to share all our interesting findings in this little talk. But I will be covering some. Uh, and then we'll do a deep dive into the step-by-step uh, -step process, um, the data analysis process from data extraction through pre-processing and analysis, followed by uh, visualization and interpretation of results. Um, <coughs> open data is similar to um, open source. It's just that when you talk about open source, you're talking about source code and applications. Right? Open data has to do with data sets that are freely available to the public, and anyone can access it and use it for whatever kind of analysis they and do whatever analysis they want to do without getting into the troubles of um, <coughs> copyright or patents or any kind of mechanism of control. Common Crawl is a non-profit organization that built and they've constantly been maintaining a repository of web crawl archive data. They've been doing this for more than 10 years, I guess. Um, so they have this web crawl archive data available in Amazon's public data set, uh, public S3 bucket. Um, a crawl is executed once every month, and at the end of the month, the um, the archive for that month is posted in this repository. This repository, as you can imagine, it's a, in a sense, it's like a copy of the internet. So it has uh, billions of web pages archive in it. And you can imagine the size of it. It's a definitely it's 100 of terabytes of data in size. Gartner is a, a global research advisory and consulting firm. Uh, they've been helping their clients, making the right decisions. and choosing the right technology or uh, making the right strategy, strategy decisions. Um, they've been doing that for their clients for more than 40 years now. So it's a pretty well-known and recognized and reputed uh, uh, research and consulting firm. What is of our interest here is their magic quadrant reports that they publish uh, on a regular basis for various different market uh, categories. So what you see on the top right-hand side is the magic quadrant. This is, this is what it, it is. What it looks like. I'm not sure if the text is readable, but the four quadrants are leaders, challengers, niche players, and visionaries. And vendors in a given ma uh, market category are placed in one of these quadrants based on a criteria. So, uh, Gartner has a criteria that they use to assess or evaluate these vendors for in a given technology or market space, and then they place these vendors in one of these quadrants. So. <coughs> And market movements is basically um, when these vendors are placed in one of these quadrants, they and the, the, they constantly publish these reports. Uh, the interval for the reports differ depending on what market category you're talking about. So when they publish a report, once a vendor is placed in one of these quadrants, the vendors are observed to move from one. Uh, either they, they they you can see some. Um, movements either in the same quadrant or it is possible that a vendor moves from one quadrant to another. Like as an example, let's say Dell acquired EMC and then we became Dell EMC. And let's say just for the sake of example, Dell EMC made a movement from challengers to leader, leaders magic quadrant in let's say July 2018. So that is what I mean by the market movements in the magic quadrants. And it's also has, it ha also has to do with the overall market trends, like where exactly is the market headed? Where are we moving in terms of uh, technology? What are some technologi technologies that are gaining tractions? And what are, what are some technologies that are not? What are some emerging technologies? And what are some disappearing technologies? Because if you are a company who is investing in a technology that's disappearing, you would want to stay, change your stra strategy, right? So that was just to lay a background for those who don't know about all these terms. Um, 
these are two separate things. We um, and this is what I will be talking about. We, when we started this project, we uh, we made a hypothesis, and one of our project goal was to see, find out if there is a correlation between what's being talked about a vendor in the media or news websites or on their websites or articles, analyst reports. Is there a correlation between those things and vendors making movements in the magic coins? So that was the hypothesis that we started with. And we wanted to see if there is a correlation. And this is one of our findings. What you see here is uh, the graph for NetApp uh, articles versus NetApp's uh, placement in the magic coordinates. So I would like you to focus on two lines, the topmost and the bottommost. So both are, I think, appearing in red color on the projector, but it's maroon and red. So the bottom one is uh, NetApp articles, and the top one is uh, NetApp's placement in the magic coordinates. And you can see there is, uh, the pattern is similar of these two lines. And this one for, was done for the general purpose disk array magic quadrant. And we looked at a lot of other companies and a lot of other magic quadrants as well to see if there's a correlation between them. Hitachi data system is another one that we looked at. Same, this is also general purpose disk array magic quadrant. And <clears throat> you can see the blue line at the top and the maroon line. Maroon line is the uh, number of articles that appeared about Hitachi and general purpose disk array, like articles that had mentioning of Hitachi and general purpose disk array. And Hitachi's placement in that uh, space, the market space um, in the magic corn. So you can see that there is a little bit of correlation, right? So let's dive deep into the process that we used uh, for our analysis, which is pretty much standard. This is just a high level step-by-step um, -step process. In reality, there's a lot more uh, steps involved, right? So when you start analyzing your data, first, the first thing that you want to do is define your objectives. What are some business problems you're trying to solve? What are some questions that you're looking, uh, answers looking, that you're looking for, right? And then for our project, we divided our, object, uh, our objectives were divided into two categories, which is hypothesis validation that I just talked about, and the ad hoc analysis. So like I said, we, we made a hypothesis that whether or not there is a correlation between what's being talked about these vendors in the market or news websites, articles, blogs, whether that has a correlation between uh, with the with that vendor making a movement in the magic quadrant, and then the ad hoc analysis part of it was for us to just kind of gain some competitive insights, because like I mentioned, I work in the competitive intelligence team, so a lot of time a lot of my time is spent uh, on finding about finding out what what our competitors are up to in the market, what strategies or what major announcements are they making, are they is there a new product launch, especially the ones that are going to have an impact on our business. So kind of gain competitive insights which, for which we uh, did text analysis on company websites, industry trends, and uh, again, the emerging and disappearing technologies that I already covered in the first slide. Also look at how technology terms like blockchain, um, public cloud, IoT, artificial intelligence, machine learning, how all these technology terms have been evolving over the past five to 10 years. Um, understanding how our competitors are transitioning in terms of technology over the past few years, this is an important one. Because um, uh, I can give an example here, like HPE acquired SimpliVity for their hyperconverged infrastructure. And after they acquired SimpliVity, they, they came up with a very robust hyperconverged uh, hyper infrastructure portfolio, right? So that was the strategy that they had, and they transitioned. Like, Hyperconverged infrastructure is not the only thing HP is doing, but it is one of one of their line of businesses. So we would want to um, be aware of such transitions or major decisions that these competitors, our competitors, are making. Um, then the next uh, next step is collection of the data. So first thing that we had to do was determine what data are we trying to collect. So common crawl was our data source, and then we had to identify what data sources are we going to use for our data. And then um, you gather the data and put it in a format that's workable for you, depending on the type of analysis you want to do. So for our project, we so for our project we identified the two categories for our data sources. Um, on the left hand side, you see IT news websites, and on the right hand side, the company websites. So um, websites like the Register, InfoWorld, these are some um, news websites that cover the data center. 
uh, infrastructure solution space to a great detail. So it was a great source of information for us. You also see PC world and computer world in the list because Dell is also into the consumer electronics business, which is the laptop business, right? And then we also looked at some companies like uh, we identified the major or the big um, on-premise infrastructure solution business providers. So we looked at all these companies. Uh, when it comes to downloading the data, uh, what you see on the right hand side is the, the image on the, on the right hand side. There is raw data, which is the web page data that is available in the common crawl archive. But like I said, it's, there's billions of web pages in it. So you cannot just connect to this data source and just download the data. There has to be an indexing mechanism for data like that. So there is index, uh, index server that um, you know has indexing for all the web pages that are available in the archive. CDX index client is a project. It is an open source project. It is available in on GitHub. I'll be sharing the links towards the end of this slide for all these GitHub links for all these uh, projects. So this project allows you to download the index data. And using that index data, you can um, further download the actual uh, raw or web page data. So we wrote a lot of scripts in Python to um, download the indexes for the domains that we were interested in. Like, for example, netapp.com or um, the nextplatform.com or the register.com. So we identified all those domains in the previous step, and then we downloaded all the uh, index data for those domains. Um, these scripts were executed on EC2 instances in um, AWS. And what you see on the right hand side, this image here, is an example of uh, what the index data looks like. I'm going to switch to the browser just to demonstrate you real quick. So this is the browser interface for the, why is it not working? I think if it's not working, I have the image on the slide also, so it's fine. It's okay, it's okay. I have the image in the slide as well. So the, this image on the right hand side is what, it shows what the index data looks like. I'm not sure if it's readable, but uh, this is for the netapp.com domain. So when you go to the browser interface, you can basically query the API. Say, um, I want to see all the index data for netapp.com domain, and it will give you all, that, all the index data. So this is what it looks like. Um, I have the link in one of my slides. So if you are interested, you can check it out afterwards. Um, then after we downloaded the index, the next step was to download the actual raw or web page data. So another project called Common Crawl Document Download Project is uh, uh, is also an open source project available on GitHub that you can use to uh, download the web, uh, web page data. Now this tool requires the index data to be fed to it as an input. So the data that we downloaded in the previous step was fed to this project as an input and this project would download the data depending on what index data you're giving it to. Um, similar to the previous step, we wrote a lot of scripts to download the data for various different domains and. Um, uh, all the websites have different way of, um, like the sections are different and they, the web pages are organized differently. So we had to do it like selectively, uh, like separately for all the domains that we were interested in. The image that you see here is for emc.com domain. This is what the data, web page data look like in our S3 bucket. So we executed the scripts again in, on EC2 instances in AWS and we stored the downloaded data, the raw web, web page data in our S3 bucket. So once we downloaded the data, next step is processing the data. This is where you kind of start filtering out the unwanted or meaningless data that does not hold any value for your analysis. It's not going to make any contribution to what you're looking for in the data. This is also where you do the cleaning and removing of duplicates and valid data and kind of start putting structure to the unstructured format. In our case, this, the, the data was very, very random and very, very extremely unstructured data. Um, for our project, we, uh, one of the steps we had to do was pre-processing where, where we had to get rid of all the HTML code. Because we are talking about the web page data which obviously has a lot of HTML and JavaScript code. And our interest is only on the text data, the plain text data, right? So DK Pro C4 Corpus is a project. It's a, it's a, 
it it has a lot of um, utilities. So boilerplate is one of the utilities that we used in our project to get rid of the HTML code. In the next slide, <coughs> excuse me, you can see this is. I'm sorry about the font size, but you can probably see the colored text is the core part of the data. And this is before HTML removal and after HTML removal is just the text data. You can see that the size of the data got reduced from 102 KB to 9 KB, which is like a, a lot of difference. The next step was to analyze the process, uh, the data, wherein we uh, start exploring the data to see what are some hidden patterns in it. Are there any trends in it? Are there any correlations? And what are some messages contained in the data? So the data processing. For the data processing piece of it, we we were running um, Spark, Scala, and uh, Python code on in Zeppelin notebooks on EMR clusters. We downloaded the data from our S3 bucket, the HTML clean data from our S3 buckets into RDDs, and we did a lot of transformations on the RDDs. And when you're doing text analysis, these are some steps that are standard. These are involved. You have to do these things, like getting rid of the special characters and removing multiple spaces and Stop words. Stop words are the words like is and the, the words that appear a lot in the English language, but they don't really hold much value. So you have to get rid of all those words. You have to do lower casing so that words like um, Asha with a capital A is not treated as different from Asha with a small a. So lower casing, tokenization, stemming, and lemmatization. These are some standard things that you do when you're doing text analysis. And then we did the n grams frequency analysis. N grams is n number of terms occurring consecutively. So there is monograms, bigrams, and trigrams. An example for bigram could be public cloud, like two words appearing together. Why we did this? Because <coughs> when you do word frequency count analysis, the number of times data appears and the number of times center appears may not mean much to you. Like It may not be very informative. But when the number of times data center appears together may mean a lot to you. Right, so we did the <coughs> the n grams frequency analysis, and then we stored this data back into our S3 bucket. This is an example of um, the data, how it looked like before the word count. Uh, sorry, before before and after the stop words removal. So you can see the words highlighted are off, and the they're they're gone from the right hand side column. Um, then we did the visualization. For visualization, we used D3JS and Zeppelin notebooks itself. Now, this is a bubble chart that is displaying the word frequency count. The size of the bubble also um, uh, has to do with the number of times the word appears. So the bigger the size of the bubble, more is the frequency of that word in the text data. So it is not, let me see if I can zoom in. So looking at this, this is this bubble chart is for NetApp domain, netapp.com domain. You can see words. I'm going to read these word, words out for you. This is storage. This is data. This is NetApp. This is cloud. This is analytics solution. So all these words kind of, you can tell that NetApp is a company that is into the data storage and cloud business, right? So we did these kind of um, visualizations for a, a lot of domains. And then the, next, the last step is really just the interpretation of results, where you kind of circle back and go back to your first step and see if you were able to find the answers for the questions that you started off with. Were you able to solve the business problems that you were looking for, right? This is a high-level architecture of the project that we ha did in AWS. This data source. The four layers are data source and data processing, analysis, and visualize. Data source is this is the public data set in S3 bucket. We downloaded the indexes, stored it in the S3 buckets. And then um, we used the common crawl project to um, download the actual raw web page data, which was stored back into the S3 bucket. And then we used the DK Pro C4 Corpus project to get rid of the HTML tag. And then we fed the HTML clean data to the Zeppelin notebooks on EMR clusters to do the analysis. And then in the end, the data was visualized in uh, D3JS. We have not been using Tableau yet, but it is on our roadmap. Um, these are some important links I was talking about. If you're really interested in um, exploring this data, common crawl archive, um, you can um, visit these links and find out more about it. 
Um, this is the team that I would like to thank because this analysis wouldn't have been possible without these brilliant minds. We won an award for this project uh, for a techni technical paper that we submitted for uh, a contest at Dell Technologies. Um, that is all I had for this talk. Um, if you have any questions, I will be around. If you have any kind of feedback, any ideas, anything that you would like to discuss, I'll be here and uh, happy to have that conversation with you. So thank you all. Thank you.